All right. Well, hello and welcome to our fireside chat on the art of hiring strategies for attracting and retaining top talent. My name is Heath McNally and I'm a talent acquisition manager here at Employment Hero. My talent acquisition career started uh, over 13 years ago, where I've worked across a number of different industries from the public sector to large tech consultancies, as well as FMCG, telco, fintech, you name it, I've done it. So um, I guess last couple of years, I've made myself at home in some software startups. Uh, and more recently, last, uh, last year or so, I've been calling Employment Hero home. Uh, and needless to say, it's an amazing place to be. Uh, and we're building some amazing products, just like you, uh, you might imagine. So um, yeah, so thank you for joining us today. Um, today, we'll delve into the current state of employee movements across the APAC region, as well as discuss the strategies for attracting and retaining top talent with a panel of amazing talent acquisition professionals. Throughout the discussion today, I will be referencing some findings from our most recent Talent Insights report, where we surveyed 1,000 employees across Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia about hiring, retention, and overall employee sentiment. These insights will aid in some of our discussion today. Before I introduce our guest speakers, we have some quick housekeeping. We've allocated some time at the end of the webinar for your questions. So please don't hesitate to type your questions into the box down the bottom of your Zoom screens. And uh, we'll make sure that we get to as many as we can at the end of the discussion. Following the end of the webinar, you'll be presented with a short survey as well. So we'd love for you to fill that in. And um, also just note that, uh, you know, if you haven't been able to attend uh, live today uh, or you'd like to watch this again, uh, this is definitely being recorded uh, and we will be sharing the recording as well as the Talent Insights reports and mm -hmm. any additional resources that we kind of talk about today um, through an email after the webinar has concluded. So thank you with uh, thank you for joining us for all of that. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our amazing panelists for today. Um, first up, we have Sarah Mills Krutelek who is also known as SMK. She's the founder and head of talent at PathMint. SMK started her career in the Silicon Valley, heading global recruitment teams for Twitter and Dropbox at their pre-IPO stage. She's also recruited and been a recruiting advisor for companies such as Tesla, Apple, Mixpanel, Chronosphere, Charles Schwab, Sephora, and Louis Vuitton, just to name a few. And now in Australia, SMK is a startup advisor and angel investor. She's founded and manages PathMint, a recruitment and HR consultancy for fast grow growing startups in the US and APAC regions. Joining SMK today is Joanna Pilatus, head of talent acquisition at IBM. Joe is an incredible talent uh, acquisition professional. She has um, an amazing career so far where she brings a wealth of her experience in various aspect aspects of her field. Uh, she started her journey in talent acquisition, um, looking after graduate and early career hiring and has made her way through to technical and executive hiring. Uh, and, you know, she's um, she's played a key role in enhancing the employer brand of such a well-known organization, as well as providing best in class, innovative talent acquisition strategies to many parts of the large and dynamic business that is IBM. Joe now leads the talent acquisition uh, function for IBM across Australia and New Zealand, where she has an amazing team of talent acquisition professionals, and she gets to showcase IBM ANZ on the global stage. And our final panelist is Pamela Stevenson, head of talent at Harrison AI. Pam has over 10 years of recruitment experience across uh, agencies and in-house talent teams, and she's worked for the likes of Google and ComBank. After joining Scale Up World over three years ago as head of talent for Harrison AI, Pam is loving the opportunity to do the impactful work in the AI healthcare sector. She cares deeply about people, creating a delightful hiring experience and loves bringing teams of awesome humans together. So welcome to you all and thank you for joining us for our session today. Thank you for having us. Uh, so let's kick off by speaking about the current state of movement across the APAC regions. Our report finds uh, that employees in Australia and New Zealand are expressing a desire to change jobs with over 60% of them actively seeking opportunities in different organizations within the next six months. In Southeast Asia, however, employees are more focused on internal development, in, internal development and lateral movements. So the idea of career cushioning comes into play here. Career cushioning, this may be a new term for some of us on the call here today, 
Um, it essentially is the act of making yourself more horrible should you unexpectedly lose your job or so that you become more, des more desirable when you want to leave your job. In other words, it's future-proofing your career to accommodate for any potential movements, both internally or externally. We found that 66% of Australians, 70% of New Zealanders, and 84% of Singaporeans are actively engaged in career cushioning. However, it, it's Malaysia that takes the lead with an impressive 92% of those surveyed looking to ex expand their skill sets by seeking mentorships and freelance opportunities. It's just amazing numbers, really. So maybe first question, love to throw it over to Pam. Um, I guess, you know, from your perspective, what does the concept of career cushioning um, imply for the, the state of job seeking? Um, so based on your experiences, what key factors should hiring managers and recruiters bear in mind regarding this trend of career cushioning? Yeah. So look, career cushioning, it's, it's a wonderful concept. And in fact, I'm surprised it's only 60% of those surveyed in Australia that are doing it. I would advise it should be 100%. Um, and the reason why is no matter what, when the market is great or when it's down like it is right now, I think we all need to be keeping an eye on the future. And the way to future-proof your career is through employing career cushioning strategies. So those are the things like you mentioned, like seeking out a mentor, growing your network, um, you know, doing continuous learning to upskill yourself, um, you know, building your personal brand, um, making it, making, doing as much as you can, even doing a little side hustle, whether it's coaching or career, providing advisory services, whatever you can do to make yourself more employable is always a good idea and will give you that confidence that no matter what happens in the market, in particular, the instability we see right now, that there will be an opportunity for you, whether that's through your side hustle or whether that's through the connections you've made. So I think it's a little bit naive of employers to think that this isn't happening or it's not, you know, it certainly does imply that there is a level of always a level of openness or at least a passive openness, if not active, to seeking out a better opportunity. So when you know that your you, when you know that your employees are doing career cushioning most likely, and that anyone, generally speaking, is open to a better opportunity, what that means is that you don't take it for granted when you have your employees. So you always got to be thinking, well, what can I do to keep them engaged, to keep them retained, to keep them attracted to you know what we initially sold them on the, on the promise to come work for us. So. Some of the things that um, are really, really important these days is, you know, making sure that you have great leaders in place. Great leaders will get you through tough times, good managers. Invest in your people leaders, um, put them on training, coaching courses, whatever you need to do to make sure that they're empowered to help teams deliver their best work and to take care and support their people. Um, I think it's also really important um, to make sure that you're, you're investing in growing your employees. One of the biggest reasons people leave, it's not just a bad manager, but it's a lack of career development and growth. And there are so many things that organizations of any size can do to make sure that they're showing they're investing and they care about their employees. So whether that's learning and development budgets, whether that's having career advancement opportunities and a structured growth framework, um, internal mobility processes clearly defined, um, all these sorts of things become really, really important. Absolutely, great points. And um, yeah, like, I mean, maybe SMK, you know, with with all that in mind, like uh, around, you know, engaging your talent, fostering, I guess, that career cushioning, you know, maybe 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 the, the idea is more around uh, engaging that talent directly and, um, and helping them foster their own careers uh, and not so much about cushioning it. Um, I guess, what, what other strategies would um, a business face kind of to, I guess, tackle this themselves? How do they, how do they make sure they're, they're, I guess, equipping their recruiters and their hiring managers to, uh, I guess, foster that for, for those uh, people they want to bring into the business as well? How do they make themselves stand out um, when they are trying to attract people through to, to kind of um, let them know that they're going to have this ability to continue their, I guess, their development? Yeah, sure. Keith. Um, a lot of my lens is going to be focused on um, startups, early stage startups and scale ups, because that's who I've worked with in the past. 
And I would say to a lot of the founders that I work with, um, when you're pitching to raise funds for your business, it's a very different pitch than pitching to a candidate as to why they should join your organization. So one of the things I encourage a lot of the startups that I work with to do is every quarter to kind of reevaluate their employer brand proposition, like an EVP statement. And we used to do this at Twitter once a quarter, we'd sit down with the comms team and we'd figure out, okay, like, who are we now? Because there's so many different chapters within a business and you kind of have to keep up with that because your employees will take note of the changes that are happening within the organization. It's also really important, I'd echo what Pam said, around leaders being able to really communicate the changes within an organization, whether you're a three-person company or a over a thousand-person company, it's really important to be able to connect with your employees and kind of let them know what's going on. I had the pleasure of building the Udemy team here in APAC um, over the last two years pre-IPO. And as we were scaling, one of the things I really learned about working with Udemy is how important upskilling is. And so I know Pam kind of mentioned that as well, but upskilling your employees is a really great way to show that you invest in them and that you care. And there's so many amazing programs like Go One, LinkedIn has programs, Udemy has programs to upskill your employees. And it's really necessary, especially as we think about the advancement of AI. We're doing tons of AI recruiting, Web3 recruiting, machine learning recruiting. And um, these people don't just pop down from anywhere. We all have to learn how to keep up with this new technology. So investing in people there is incredibly important. Another quick story that I heard yesterday was um, there were a couple of startups that I've been working with. Instead of doing layoffs, what they're offering to people are new opportunities within the company. Say perhaps they're not doing recruiting, so they're offering to recruiters maybe to join the sales team for six months, learning a different skill, still keeping that employee engaged and happy and flying the flag for the company. And then when you have to start recruiting again or working on your product or whatever it is that you're moving, moving that employee out of, you can swip, switch them back into the role that they were in. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and Joe, look, obviously you have a different perspective on this. Uh, IBM is quite a large organization, uh, a global organization. What are your thoughts uh, on on this this kind of trend, and how do, how does IBM kind of uh, tackle it? So I think um, one thing for us, we are a global company, so we definitely have different levers in terms of um, how to retra- re- you know, retain and attract our employees. But I think as a manager, from my experience, I would definitely say that we shouldn't assume and we should very much listen to the individual drivers of people. I think also, you know, surveying as well and reading um, a lot of data. I've seen that recently um, I met up with uh, LinkedIn and they said that, you know, the driver for compensation has really um, been pushed down since COVID and other things are really driving individuals. So you know, from my team, a lot that I'm hearing of is that flexibility of being able to work wherever you want to work or, you know, compressed working week is another big one um, that I've been hearing. So doing your your five days um, within four. So I think the biggest thing that organisations have to realise is that we shouldn't have a one size fits all um, in terms of retaining and, and attracting um, employees and candidates to our brand that we really need to listen to to what drives them and I think it's it's okay to to go out and to survey people within our organization as well as external and whether that needs to be anonymous or not but I think the the organizations need to not see it as a, a cookie cutter approach and really listen to to what drives those individuals to be able to better um, retain them within the organization Completely correct. Uh, it sounds like, um, yeah, it's more of a personalized approach yeah. uh, is kind of the, the way to go. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, this is a great segue because, um, you know, the current hiring market is still very candidate driven, uh, as we're probably all experiencing, um, no matter what's happening in the economic climate at the moment. So it's definitely, definitely still candidate driven. Um, and be- businesses are increasingly having to market their employer brand and EVP or employee value proposition, uh, as well as implementing compelling candidate journeys to win over that talent. So we can all agree company culture, employee brand is incredibly important to attracting and obtaining top talent. Um, 
our data, data has been showing um, that poor company culture was one of the top three reasons for employees across all four regions to seek a position elsewhere. So the highest was Malaysia, with 43% of those employees looking for another role fueled by poor company culture. Uh, and that's a massive jump from 2021, where it was only 27%. So creating a positive work environment where employees are satisfied and inclined to stay is crucial, um, while having a negative company culture can harm your employer brands and can deter potential new hires. So, um, yeah, Pam, maybe, you know, maybe you can kind of explain to us how important company culture and employer brand um, is to retaining, uh, I guess, current employees, as well as attracting them, like you kind of mentioned before. But talk us about, like, I guess, your, your experience at Harrison AI. Yeah, so our team spent a fair amount of time um, a couple of years ago really defining our employer brand and our employee value proposition. Um, and and what, we, what we land on is that it's really important to make sure we get the messaging right for future employees looking to join us, what's in it for them, and also for current employees, what's in it for them. So you're always answering that question with your EVP to make sure it's relevant. Um, so what we did is we surveyed our employees, found out what drives them. We looked at external research. We know that the LinkedIn data tells us frequently that compensation, work-life balance, culture, and flexibility are amongst the top three drivers um, for um, why people stay and, and why people um, want to join an organization. Um, and we looked at our key, our, our talent that we frequently hire, which is in tech and what do they want? Um, right now, there's an emphasis on uh, an increase in looking for job stability. So we try to make sure we address that. Um, and there's obviously the, the flexibility component, which is really important for the tech sector as well. So with our EVP, we also wanted it to be genuine and true to the actual lived experience. The last thing we want is to oversell someone on what it's like to work here in our culture and then be completely different and mismatched when they arrive. And unfortunately, that does happen <laughs> all too often. So um, what we did was we ended up combining what our employees want, what our what our talent target, target market wants. And we came up with kind of a beautiful um, couple of pages, a little document, which we send out to prospective candidates, anyone that gets an interview with us. We've shared it with employees. We've launched it. And what that contains is a number of non-monetary benefits. Um, so things that really, um, there's a more of an emphasis on doing work that matters and impact. In particular, since COVID, it has spotlighted the fact that people don't just want to work for a company and just earn money. They want to work for a cause they're passionate about that's meaningful. And the drive for meaningful work is what should be reflected, I think, in everyone's EVP. How is your product contributing, making a wider impact, even at a global level, if possible, because that's really what people want to see a little bit more of. In addition to, as you've mentioned, having a good culture, so making sure that's highlighted in your EVP. And then you have all of the other kind of benefits around parental leave, you know, learning and development, growth, what opportunities do you offer there? You have to spotlight what you give in terms of flexibility. So, you know, we say the way we phrase it in our EVP is that nine to five is so 1995. So what that means is that, you know, we don't expect people to necessarily stick to core hours. Um, it's about output over hours for us. And we make that clear in our EVP. Um, we also make it clear that we, we really, that diversity is not just a buzzword, it's in our DNA. We have EIG groups. We, we really try to foster an inclusive culture because we recognize you bring your whole self to work and that's where you're able to do your best work when a, when a company supports that. And so thinking about your EVP, you've got to think about what culture are you trying to build and how will your, um, how will your EVP help you get there and help you attract and retain the right people? Excellent. Um, and look, I mean, uh, Joe, I, I guess you, you kind of talked through a little bit more about how IBM engages their talent, but how do they keep it current? How do they look to improve it? Um, and I guess, you know, what, what I guess is your experience in how they kind of set themselves apart from uh, competitors in the, in the same sort of space? So, um, Heath, I think that there has been a big shift, especially pre and post COVID. So if we're looking at uh, from a cultural point of view, um, not just at IBM, but I think when you're you're looking at how other organizations are also marketing themselves, we went from um, having you know ping pong tables in our offices and coffee machines and things like that to bring people into the office. And since COVID, I found that there's been a bit of a shift and it's more around a culture of that psychological safety. You know, what can we be doing from a uh, mental health perspective?
for our culture, for the people, for, for our team. So, for example, on Friday, we try not to have um, meetings after 12 o'clock um, so that people have that opportunity to, you know, be able to do what they need to do, whether that is go for, for a walk or connect in with family and those sorts of things. So we're very much looking about how can we make sure that people are comfortable and happy from a psychological safety point of view. I think also from um, an IBM perspective, we've been around for over 100 years. So we have to continually reinvent. So not only reinvent how we go out to market um, in terms of the offerings that we offer our clients, but also what we're offering for our internal, um, our people. So I think for us, it's really important to listen to what drives people and rather than that tokenistic, um, you know, the coffees or the the beers at, at five o'clock, you know, what else is, is driving people to be able to feel safe within their organisation and to feel comfortable to, to show up as their authentic self from, um, from a day-to-day perspective. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, it sounds like yeah, it has been quite a big of, bit of a culture shift, keeping up with the times, obviously. Um, yeah, and, like, I mean, that, that, you know, kind of lends itself to, like, how the, the hiring market has changed over time. Um, it's become you know, incredibly competitive. Uh, it's a very competitive landscape. So um, SMK, how do you think recruiters can ensure they're attracting the best talent for their organization in this kind of environment? I 100% agree with you, Joe, on um, what you just said. I mean, I was working in tech in what I would call the golden era. You know, we had Michelin star chefs at Dropbox, and that was a key attracting point to bringing people into the office, having them come for lunch, you know, and letting them meet the hiring team that way. It was a real key selling a point against other big tech companies like Google. And I realized at that time, you know, those days were probably going to be numbered, this kind of beer on tap culture, you know, the beer pong tables, it was really attracting a certain type of candidate. And as we really thought about uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, really figuring out, let's put our money where our mouth is. So we developed a program called ACE. It was the Authentic Candidate Experience. And what we found was that, you know, after somebody interviews, giving them like a Dropbox t-shirt or a Twitter mug, that basically somebody would might have to go back to work and bring it with them. So they'd have to hide it in their bag. And it just, it was, it was something that would something maybe end up in the trash. So we really tried to focus on what do candidates need when they come in? And and how are we really catering to underrepresented minorities and people that we really wanted to attract onto our team? So we would survey candidates prior to coming in for their interview to find out if they had any accommodations that they needed coming in, if there were specific pronouns that they would prefer that we used throughout that process so that we could educate our hiring panels on, on how that went. And then we found that a simple email follow-up from everybody on the team just saying, it was really great to have you in the office today. Do you have any further questions? Even if you were going to proceed with that candidate or not, made the experience so much better. Um, I made that person maybe come back to us if maybe they said no in, at that time. We could reach out to them three months later, six months later, and they would gladly take our call because your pool is actually limited. You think you have endless candidates and you're just gonna find more, but you sometimes need to go back into that pool and keep fishing. So a lot of the times I'm telling my early stage startups, even if you're not planning on hiring, right away. Um, It's a good time to just start thinking about putting your brand out there, hosting lunch and learns, hosting webinars for candidates, giving them something tangible that they can use, some kind of upskilling moment so that they remember you more than just a place that they went and interviewed. Excellent. Um, Yeah, and look, I mean, we we covered a a bit of uh ground with the EVP and employee branding stuff there. So thank you for sharing. Um, Obviously, um, we, you know, we, we kind of just started touching on that candidate experience and what they're expecting. Uh, so we, we noticed like, you know, that there has been a shift in, I guess, what candidates are looking for, how significant monetary, uh, uh, like a competitive monetary kind of aspects are in shaping their expectations as well. Um, but I guess the majority of employees across all four regions that we surveyed believe their current pay does not meet their rising costs of living and inflation, um, you know, it's it's obviously lots of different things are happening around the world and, and things are sh- shifting in that space. So 
um, we noticed that the highest um, uh, shift is with the New Zealanders uh, at 61%, um, believing that they're they're not having their pay meet those changing uh, kind of uh, inflation needs. So um, we're seeing many employees across Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Malaysia, they're open to leaving their current roles for competitive offers. Um, but in addition to those competitive offers, employees are also looking for potential employers to provide reward and recognition programs, other monetary benefits like bonuses, as well as flexible working. Um, and they're all they're all great incentives when looking to move. So um, I guess, you know, I guess what, how can businesses address these salary concerns, uh, you know, with, um, with, I guess, like changes of, of all of that businesses are, you know, I've only got a certain amount of money for hiring and, and they've got budgets according to that. So um, how do, how do you attract talent um, with that in mind and, and give them something else, give them the, what they're looking for? Um, maybe Joe, do you have any examples of, of what else uh, companies can kind of provide to attract talent through and, and, and get them to sign uh, their contracts and yeah. join the company. So I think if, if we're just if we firstly focus on the the monetary um, benefits. So I think all organisations um, give bonuses and or maybe sign on bonuses. But one thing that we've really been shifting on in the last few years is equity. So. Um, Previously, equity was just given at that executive level, but I, but I know, you know, personally from an IBM perspective, we've changed our view on that to be able to give equity um, to all levels of employees. So I think organisations do need to look at from a monetary point of view, um, you know, what else that they can offer aside from the bonus and, and equity is something that we've looked at into as an organisation. I think um, other some non-financial um, aspects would be looking at internal mobility. I think that is also um, has been you know highlighted since COVID. So what does that look like in terms of actually being able to create a roadmap for um, employees in terms of what their next um, move would be and what they need to do to get there? Um, organizations also have a lot of learning so actually tapping into the learning that's available or you know there's normally organizations have funding to be able to do learning so making sure that we tap into that and I think another thing is um, now that borders are open up you know people have that you're seeing that people are going traveling and wanting to go back into some sort of normality I think also re-looking at that um, global mobility and having a look at doing short-term assignments or longer-term assignments overseas, that is also a driver or, you know, can be an attraction point for people that are looking at your company. So um, now with COVID kind of shifting into more of a normality rather than this pandemic, we're looking at people that are interested now about joining an organisation with the prospect of going overseas and doing a shorter term or longer term stint over there um, to be able to to give them breadth and to be able to, um, you know, take their families overseas and experience a different culture. So those are some of the levels that we would use here at IBM. Yeah, excellent. And and it kind of um, lends itself to, I guess, that flexible working uh, as well, work from anywhere kind of policies. Uh, and yeah, you know, like we we're talking about compressed work weeks and that kind of thing before. These are all fantastic uh, ideas. Um, and I suppose, you know, imp implementing some of these ideas, all of them, uh, lots of lots of uh, businesses might find that hard to do. You know, we, we, we hire people for specific roles and for roles that you know, often are full time. Um, so I guess how do businesses balance the need for flexibility um, from from those, those those new hires or the people in the business? How do they, they balance that with the the needs of the role and the 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 I guess the productivity needs that they kind of need to meet as well? Um, maybe I'll open this up to the panel. Anyone have any thoughts? Any ideas? Uh, if, if I touch on the compressed working week, um, Heath, we actually have two people that are doing a compressed working week, but what we do is they've got different days. So that means that by having that different day off as their, you know, their fifth day of the work week, we're um, able to ensure that there's no disruption to the business, to the stakeholders, that they 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 are working days together. So it sort of a little bit works out like a job share in, in the end where there's no impact to the candidates that are coming through as well as to the stakeholders. So I think if you manage it in that way where if you are looking at 
a compressed working week for your team to um, retain them, we're looking about how we manage that. So I think as long as there is not a disruption to the business, organisations can really use that as a way to attract and retain um, staff within the within that company. I'd like to talk about global scaling right now, because I think that's something where the, in this time where it's very easy to scale globally. And um, this is where I'm going to bring in Employment Hero. Um, I personally have a team that I'm in Melbourne. I have three people that work with me in Melbourne, but I also have a team that's in California as well to service our US clients that we work with. And there was a time where you really needed to go to a country, set up an entity, you know, get established, have that money to do that. We now live in a time where if you're an early stage startup, you can really hire people anywhere. And using um, like a PEO or an employer of record like Employment Hero to do that makes it super easy. So I'm able to service clients in the US from, from Australia very easily because now I have a team that's there and that we all have that crossover. So I'm encouraging a lot of the startups that I work with that are fully remote to not just think about their local areas, but to think about how do we really think global here, which also opens up a huge, um, a huge amount of uh, flexibility within pay scale as well. How about you, Pam? Yeah, look, I love that. Um, I'd like to plus one to everything. But I think the only thing I will add is probably just going back a little bit earlier to um, a bit of commentary around salary. And, um, you know, I think this is really important that you don't want to get on a it's slippery slope when you start trying to compete and one up on salary. <laughs> Um, and you end up attracting probably the wrong type of candidate who just chooses the higher offer. That said, our line that we use is that we recognize um, salary and compensation. It's an important thing, but it's not everything. Um, so, you know, we, we are pretty transparent. And I think it's important to be transparent with salary upfront to candidates, what kind of ballpark you're looking to hire in for what the scope of the role is. Um, as much as possible, be transparent at adverts. I say that and I feel like a hypocrite because we're not yet there, but we will be soon. <laughs> Um, that's particularly what the tech market wants, more transparency with salaries. Um, but just also think about like when it comes to offer stage as well, which is a really critical moment when candidates, good talent generally have multiple competing offers. On the salary component, think about how you can visualize graphically what other benefits do you offer. Um, so you've got your salary, you've got maybe your ESOP, maybe there's um, uh, maybe there's a bonus component. But what about costing up the, the other things that people don't often consider as much, which is important, the total package. So how much is it worth if you're offering food a couple of times a week? How much is it worth for the learning and development budget, um, the um, parental leave scheme? If you added all that together and you put like a, a little bar graph of like how much you get in other benefits, Benefits, that also creates a really compelling offer. Um, in addition to, of course, your EVP, which is all the other elements we discussed previously. Um, and I did just want to circle back to one of Joe's points around mental health. Yes, I think people these days, particularly post COVID, they're less willing to put up with an organization that isn't going to support their mental health and take care of them. Even the government has recently introduced legislation mandating employers have to be um, looking out for the interests of employees' mental health, which is a big shift. Previously, it was more just your physical safety in the workplace, but now it is certainly here. And so thinking about what your organization can do to support mental health is really important, whether that's access to an EAP service. Um, we're using Connects Health, actually. They're amazing and they do a lot with like employee well-being, run um, sessions on ergonomic design and um, fitness sessions, um, just kind of general education. But yeah, I think this is a really, really important um, aspect as well. I just wanted to um, highlight. We're working with a wonderful company called Pioneera, and they are an AI tool that actually layers over all of uh, your employees' work, and it essentially will uh, figure out when an employee is close to burnout. So it's giving um, lots of, it's like a spell check for burnout, basically. ANZ Bank uses it. Um, they're, it's like definitely showing that it is keeping people from taking unnecessary medical leaves and really keeping people very engaged and giving people the tools that they need. So I think we're going to see a huge swath of companies that are really focused using AI technology to kind of build that. Um, and so it's really incredible what's happening right now. Yeah, it's really impressive. Um, the Grammarly for, for burnout. Very cool. Um, well, Pam, look, I mean, we were talking around, obviously, EVP, the benefits, that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to 
how a candidate experiences the recruitment process, how they interact with with the company as they go through it. What's it look like at Harrison AI? How how do you kind of how do you kind of approach it? How have you adjusted it over time? What does the candidate journey look like? Yeah, so um, great question. I think um, I, I do need to put a lens on this that I, I work at a company where we have 250 people. We're a startup scale up somewhere in that phase. So we can offer what I think is really important to candidates as much as you can, which is more personalized experience. Um, now, I know at scale that is not always possible, but certainly I'm going to give you what we've done, and these can be adapted for larger companies like IBM. So um, with, I'll start from the beginning of the process um, as much as possible, but headhunting candidates, when we reach out, we don't send blanket emails. We do actually personalize what we liked about someone's experience and we open with that and why we think, why we have specifically messaging them for the role. Um, that gives us a really good response rate. We're at over 35% on LinkedIn and we keep it short. Nobody likes to read anything. Everyone's busy these days. So keep it like under 200 words. Um, just get people to reach out, that's the goal. Um, so we're very personalized there, but also, when people, we want to leave candidates delighted whether they get the job or they don't. Obviously, this impacts your brand, your employer brand either ways. And so you want, and particularly if it's a bad experience. So you want to try to avoid that and make it as good as possible and give value back to the candidates at any stage that they enter or finish the process. So when it comes to um, applying for a role, obviously just do the basics, get back to them, whether they get the whether they're passing through or not. That is often missed. Um, and when we reject candidates, I hate to say use that word reject, but when we when we say, look, you're not right for this role, I'm sorry to let you know, we also give them a little bit of value back in the form of I link them to, to some blogs that I've written on um, you know, interview, interview tips, um, how to avoid the most common interview mistake, um, questions to ask during an interview. And very soon we're about to include a link to a job seeker resource pack we've put together, which um, is basically open sourcing our interview tips and insights and um, how to really um, have career success with your CV and all these kind of cool things. So we're giving back even when they don't get the job. Um, and then we're also linking back to say, hey, if you'd like to keep across our communications and you like our company, you want to hear about our updates, here's a link to our newsletter. So we're building that at the same time. Um, and then the other things that we do is obviously if a candidate, you know, they get through the interview process, um, we make sure that we give them a very thorough interview prep call. Um, we give them notes. We already do a lot of the research for them in terms of links to our company or relevant podcasts. We put in our EVP. Um, of course, they have to do their own research too, but we do make it a little bit easier for them and give them a proper candidate prep guide, um, which, you know, we've had a lot of um, really good feedback from candidates and that they feel really well taken care of. Um, and then we, of course, make sure that after the interview, you know, post interview feedback within a couple of days or when you say you're going to get back, you have to do it. And if you've been on a candidate on the other end, the amount of, it's actually shocking these days as a candidate, I'm hearing people are ghosted or they don't hear back for a week beyond when they said they were going to get, you know, um, so it's really just getting these basics right. And it's surprising the number of candidates that when you do call them, when you say you'll call them and give them feedback, that they go, oh my God, I'm surprised I heard from you. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for giving me, actually taking the time to give me personalized feedback. Now, I know it's not always possible at scale to pick up the phone to everyone, although I think you should, um, and give, particularly if they've taken the time to prep for an interview, you, sh you should be calling everyone to give feedback irrespective of the outcome. Um, but at the very least, sometimes they don't pick up and you try multiple times, send an email, put in a link where they can call to, to get the feedback at the very least. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to, you know, the offer stage, there's a lot you can do there to personalize that experience. We're exploring an offer platform, either Pave or Agora, which, you know, throws confetti on the screen. And it's, it's a really nice moment. If you think about the moments that matter to candidate, this is one of the most pivotal when they actually get the offer in writing. Um, so, you know, how you can make that delightful, whether that's with a platform or whatever else, I think is a really good idea. Um, and it also obviously shows out the compensation really nicely and, and, and visually. Um, and then there's also like welcome messages in there from the team and things like that. Anything you can do to try to encourage and offer acceptance, um, but also make it engaging. Um, and then the final thing, I sorry, this is a really long answer, um, but I think what also um, we do is a little bit different for a I would like to say we have the budget to do it for all candidates, but we don't. But for candidates that are senior or above, we do actually send them when they get to the final stages of our process. We send them a book that I've got co um, that I've got signed by one of our co-founders, and the book is by Adam McKay, and it's called "This Is Gonna Hurt." It is a great book. 
it's a really funny but also sad. Uh, I'd recommend everyone to read it. Um, it's about a doctor in the NHS and he ends up keeping a diary of his experience but then gets out because it's absolutely, he just doesn't enjoy it anymore. But this book is just kind of highlights how the healthcare system is at capacity and what our product is trying to do is solve that and make it a more equitable healthcare future for everyone. And so our co-founders sign the book and they say, this is why we do what we do. And this, we send this to candidates um, and it's really nice. It's not like, you know, Sarah, you mentioned like swag and then it's, it's awkward if they don't get the job or like, you know, it's like a reminder. We don't do that, we, but we do give a book and we found that works really well and it is pretty personalized approach. Um, and then I uh, always, yeah, we, we've done actually some really crazy personalized stuff. We've once sent flour to a candidate um, who um, actually didn't join us in the end, but we sent her flowers. It was like, her, you know, her, she had a tattoo of like a, um, I, know, I can't remember what flower it was, but it was like a native flower. And we sent her that for a native country, a country from South Africa. And she loved it, but unfortunately didn't, didn't join us, although maybe for the future. Um, so we've done a few creative things at the final stages. Um, and then obviously, like when it comes to onboarding, I think it's really important to make sure, you know, usually there's like four, sometimes six weeks before someone starts, there should be a weekly touch point. So map that out before a candidate joins, somebody is getting in touch with them, whether that's your PNC, whether that's their manager, which of course it should be as well. Think about making sure whatever touch points you're communicating weekly before they arrive so that there's not this big disconnect. And that is also a danger zone for when a candidate might just accept another offer um, and reject yours, even though they verbally accepted and whatnot. So just trying to keep them engaged throughout the process from start to finish, really important and personalized. Awesome. And maybe SMK, you know, you've got the lens of working with some very, I guess, early stage startups, smaller businesses, um, maybe maybe a little bit leaner uh, as well. So what like what are some of the essential things that, you know, you need to get right in that candidate experience from your perspective, from what you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we work with uh, startups all the way up to startups that are about ready to IPO. So all, all sorts of stages and at Pathment. We are so lucky. We call ourselves the anti-agency. We're not an in-house, we're not a recruiting agency. We're actually in-house talent advisors that are advising people on processes. And what I realized is there, especially four years of working with startups and scale-ups here in Australia, there's no one size fits all for a company um, as far as what works. And so um, what we try to do is really identify where the, where the real needs are and the types of candidates that they're trying to attract. Yesterday, I was talking to a founder and he's trying to pull candidates off construction sites to work with them um, to come into the office and, and work on a product that's geared towards folks in the construction industry. So um, we have to to really focus on how are we going to go and type, try and engage that type of candidate. It's not your typical, I'm going to reach out on LinkedIn kind of messaging. Um, so I'm a big fan of tools, um, big fan, and I'm so lucky in the fact that I do invest in companies. I'm constantly reviewing various tools and startups that are kind of focused on engagement and the employee experience. I'm such a huge fan of Employment Hero, so I probably wouldn't be here today. I personally use Employment Hero because it has made my life at Pathment managing my team so easy. And Pam, I know you talked about the onboarding experience. I've had so many of the people that work at Pathment tell me it's one of the most beautiful onboarding experiences they ever had. And it's because everything is kind of set up. There are so many templates. It's very customizable. It also makes my, my one-on-ones very easy because there are specific templates that you can use. You can ensure that all of that data is being captured. It was super easy to implement. So the big thing that I'm hearing from businesses that I'm working with are it can't be too costly and it's got to be very easy for me to use. And I've got to be able to implement it very quickly because a lot of people don't have a whole lot of time. Um, so when I do come into a business, the first thing we're asking is, do you have an applicant tracking system? Um, applicant tracking systems are incredibly important when you're about to start out recruiting. And a lot of times when we've got really early stage startups, they're keeping resumes in a drive somewhere and they've got spreadsheets. So what we're trying to do is get that into a system so that you can kind of follow those processes that Pam is talking about. In fact, for all the listeners out there, I think we'll include my Pathment recruiting checklist that takes you all the way through to onboarding so that you kind of can follow what works best for you, but it's base, our basics for how you would do that. 
Um, there's some amazing applicant tracking systems out there that are actually fairly inexpensive. Workable is one that I've used many times. It has an AI talent mapping tool because a lot of people, hiring managers, can't be bothered going onto LinkedIn, doing, doing Boolean search strings, doing some of those reach outs. Workable makes that super easy. Greenhouse also has an AI functionality. I've worked with tools like Lever, and I know that Employment Hero is now going to be launching theirs, um, and it's going to be pretty exciting. So I'm really pumped that that's included in our package here at Pathwing. So I'm going to dig my teeth into it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to you uh, having a look at SMK. It's, it's actually shaping up to be fantastic. Um, Awesome. So might pause there for just for a moment because we'd love to hear from the audience. Uh, and look, we're going to launch a bit of a, a poll now. Um, just we want to understand what strategies do you use to retain top talent in your business? So you probably see something pop up in your screen now. Um, love to kind of hear what you're thinking. Obviously, compensation benefits uh, are, you know, a lot of a lot of businesses, uh, you know, trying to use what they have or reward and recognition programs. Employment Hero have a fantastic uh, way of kind of handling that as well. Um, we we have our uh, shout outs. We have our uh, values champions that we kind of promote through our, our platform as well. Um, and then there's flexible working arrangements. And, you know, there's other strategies. Love to kind of hear what you have to say. So submit your choice. And um, we'll just wait a few seconds to kind of see what's coming through. Yeah, just on that, Heath, I think that's a yeah. good one. Yeah, but we have a kudos channel, so we're using Slack. Yeah. And people just ad hoc kudos at someone for doing a great job. It really helps to encourage a really nice, positive, supportive culture. And then kind of more structured every quarter, um, we do have kind of um, more values-based awards so people can nominate for a much a much bigger award with an actual monetary, like yes. I think Two fifty dollar Prezi voucher at the end of it, oh, um, for living the values. So it's a nice way to also kind of reinforce the values and, and provide a bit of extra recognition. Um, and Employment Hero does it too. So I'm able to actually give uh, people kudos through Employment Hero whenever something amazing happens. So whenever somebody on my team fills a role, I'm able to gift them through the Employment Hero system. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's really, really simple to use. Um, and we have a Slack integration for it now too. I'm not sure if you've seen that as some okay. Um, awesome. Well, it looks like we've got the results in. Uh, surprisingly, or not, maybe not surprisingly, flexible working arrangements are the top choice um, for, for most businesses to, to I guess, leverage and, uh, and help retain and attract new talent. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously um, recognition rewards programs, probably something people, you know, haven't had access to previously. Maybe they've not had, um, I guess, uh, a system to help enable that. So, you know, definitely, um, you know, you can be, you can get be as simple as kind of sending an email of kudos or a, or a Slack message, or, um, you know, maybe you have a WhatsApp group or whatever it might be, but these kinds of programs are super, super cheap, super easy to do, um, but they have massive impact as well. So, um, but thank you so much for participating. Um, cool. So, look, it's actually a good, uh, good uh, way to kind of talk about a next topic, which is, recruitment technologies and, and how to, I guess, um, really enable yourself to, to, to attract the right talent. Um, uh, also, um, you know, make your life easier as someone who's a hiring manager or a recruiter. So, um, you know, we'll talk about um, how, I guess, recruitment technology has evolved over the last few years. Uh, and we've kind of touched on it a few times already, but I'd love to hear, I guess, about what technology has uh, enabled or made more efficient for for each of you how has it helped scale um when you you've been hiring um you know maybe a number of people at once or um, or just hiring for the first time and that kind of thing so maybe we'll pop back to you smk um i'd love to hear about how you've helped businesses gear up for scaling um you know what's your like you, you kind of touched on a few of them but what's your kind of go-to recruitment tools at the moment and um i guess yeah like i mean how do you think technology has evolved uh over the last couple of years i'm like laughing as you're saying this because i remember <laughs> very early in my recruiting career that um i was at a workshop or a seminar and they said oh someday you all your recruiters are going to be out of jobs and I'm still here 15, 20 years later, how many, many years it's been. Um, and actually the processes don't really change that much. The tools get better 
And if you can harness those tools um, and really use them to your advantage, it does make your life easier. But oftentimes I find you need somebody who's very experienced as a recruiter to still understand that because you've got this amazing high powered tool, but you still have to use it. And so um, I'll use the case of Chronosphere. They are um, a, the fastest growing unicorn in the US. Um, I started with them, it was just a small leadership team, was building out their entire team and I really needed to think about the future. Um, and uh, even the founders at the time couldn't see how fast they were growing, but then they accepted a check from Greylock and everything blew up. So we really needed to build systems and processes and put those into place for that growth. And I'm extremely proud of where they are today because we set them up for that kind of success. So we brought in Greenhouse, which is, I think, a really great tool as an ATS if you're going to go global and it builds, if, especially if you're going to have lots of distributed offices and putting in those really important processes that Pam was talking about to ensure you had checks and balances, to ensure you had smooth processes, because there comes a time where a founder may not be able to be in every single interview um, and make every single, off, every single offer call at the end. So bringing in those tools to help make your life easier, to make sure that you're not letting a candidate slip through the cracks when you've had over 2000 people apply for your jobs and making sure you're getting back to all of those people thoughtfully um, is really important. So having tools, like I said, like Greenhouse is a big, it's probably my favorite um, ATS system at the moment. Um, to do that. But then also there are some amazing tools out there like Crystal Nose, um, which is an AI tool that allows you uh, to determine from somebody's writing what their personality is and how to approach them. So um, one of the things I'll do first before reaching out to a candidate is run Crystal Nose over somebody's LinkedIn profile and figure out what is the best way to approach them. What we found with engineers, especially female engineers, that it typically takes three to four reach outs in order to keep them engaged. And so what our team oftentimes has to do is really roll up their sleeves and continually find a way to thoughtfully reach out to candidates to get them engaged. So we have a very high um, diversity rate of hiring, especially in engineering for a lot of our companies. And we can typically do it in about 30 days, hire, hire people for a company where the industry standards typically is 60 to 90 days. Um, yeah, I mean, that crystal nose sounds really interesting. Um, anyone else have any pieces of tech that really enhance that candidate experience um, or, you know, just other pieces of tech that kind of enhance the recruiter or hiring manager experience? I think uh, something that we're doing, uh, we, we walked away from it for a little bit, but we're reintroducing it is assessments. So I think especially when you have that scale where you've got a lot of applicants or, you know, in particular in our early professional space, the intern and graduate program, uh, when you've got so many people applying um, and how to help us to better screen. So having those assessments in place to be able to, um, you know, bring down a, a long list for us. Um, so making sure that when we are using assessments, they are something that are engaging um so that you know people aren't opting out because they're afraid of an assessment so something that is fun but also brings that element that we are able to assess them against other candidates so i think um for those organizations that do have a, quite a large um, number of applicants looking at a tool such as that would help them um, from a recruiter perspective, um, being able to do their job more efficiently by having an assessment in place. Yeah, and I think that the trend is uh, obviously uh, with AI, a lot of these tools when it comes to resume screening, candidate sourcing, um, assessing candidates better, video interviews, they're all AI driven yeah. um, and they cost money. And, <laughs> and to invest in them, to make it work your while, you'd probably be more interested in doing it if you had more volume recruitment. Um, now, in my case, we, we don't have volume recruitment. So for us, we haven't so much invested in these, but one I'm particularly interested to do when we have a little bit more budget will be something around, um, uh, there, there's a recent study actually, and I, I will link you guys and share this to all the attendees afterwards um, from the AFR, which um, is from Monash University, and they've just published it about how AI is more likely to hire women than humans. 
And so there's like an AI chatbot that you could use to the initial assessment. Um, and it found that um, when recruiters and hiring managers didn't know the gender of the candidate, but used the chatbot to do the assessment, more women were assessed um, at higher, <laughs> highly than, than they were if they knew the gender up front. Um, and so these sorts of tools and um, encouraging us to um, be a lot more thoughtful and considered and, and be able to properly reduce bias in the process, I think are really, really important, particularly for organizations are looking to hire more women in tech like we are. Um, and so that's where I would put um, my sort of investment. Um, but you know, I do I do recognize there is a lot of innovation that has been happening, particularly in larger organizations for volume recruitment. Um, yeah, that, though, for us, it's more been a focus of just to because we're a little bit more constrained by cost. It's more about automation, making sure we have integration set up properly so that we're efficient to do our work in the best way possible without spending heaps on systems yet. Though where I have the budget, I, I would look into something like this. And I'm also looking into an offer platform that I mentioned earlier, which just makes it um, will help improve our offer acceptance rate, <laughs> hopefully. I, and so it, it seems like reducing friction um, is a really big point of a lot of the technologies that we use, making sure that we have um, the ability to get back to candidates when they are expecting us to. Um, and then, you know, leveraging AI to kind of enhance how we operate, removing some admin burden, that kind of thing. I know that we've been using ChatGPT and and other generative AI here for uh, writing job descriptions, um, even looking at how our templates read um, and adapting those templates to the right audience as well. So there's lots of different things you can do, and, and some of them are free. Um, so which is which is great. Um, so awesome! Thank you so much for covering that. Um, I do have a final question for the panel, um, and look, it's I'd love to know what if anything, if it's just one piece of practical take-home advice that you give to our audience today, what would it be? Um, maybe SNK, maybe if you want to kick off. Yeah, the reason why I became a recruiter is because I really love people succeeding on their career journey and watching people kind of thrive. So treating people like humans is going to be incredibly important, especially in the next few years with the advancement of AI. So not losing sight of what we're actually trying to do, which is to guide people to the right jobs, the right companies. Um, that's something I'm incredibly passionate about. And um, at Pathment, we're pretty picky about the people that we work with because we want our clients to feel the same way about, um, about the hiring. Go for it, Pam. <laughs> okay, all right. So my, my biggest tip for everyone is to grow your network. Um, your network is your net worth. And um, I honestly wouldn't be where I am today were it not for the people and the mentors that helped me along the way. Um, and particularly if you are in a startup scale up, it can be lonely. You don't have a big team. And even if you are in a large enterprise, everybody has to be um, bringing in new ideas, finding ways to innovate. You don't just want to be in a position where you're just acquiring talent. That's a dangerous position to be in in the market right now, I feel like, because um, the market has slowed. 30% of, of Australian jobs, it's actually, sorry, Australians are hiring 30% less than we were this time last year, according to LinkedIn survey data. Um, and so, you know, talent acquisition is in, it's in a tough spot right now. And I really feel for our industry. So the best way that we can survive is to upskill ourselves, to grow our networks, um, and just to be there for each other and leverage supporting each other and helping somebody out who might be in need right now. And there's, there's a few of us in this uh, in this boat. So um, I would really encourage you to grow your network, um, give back where you can, and um, that I think will help put us in a better position for the future and diversify your skills. Great. And and from my, pers uh, from my perspective, one piece of advice is to really have a look at your candidate experience and do note that you know, for those that aren't progressing through to your offer stage, their experience almost needs to be, you know, as superior or even more superior than those that you are offering because you never know how you are going to engage with those people, you know, in the future, whether we need to reach out to them for another role or they might become a vendor later on. So it's really important from that candidate experience perspective, not only for those that are progressing to offer, but for those that we are not progressing with to really look at your experience that you're giving them so that they are able to walk away still happy with, you know, the, uh, you know, the end to end experience that you've given them throughout your, throughout your company. So I think that's something that I would really uh, tell everyone to, to definitely revisit their experience that they're giving. 
Absolutely. Yeah, great experiences, no matter what the outcome is, they stick in your mind. Um, I definitely can think of a few uh, that I've experienced and definitely a few bad ones as well, right? So, uh, no, great perspective. Thank you, everyone. Um, look, I am conscious of time. We unfortunately are going to run out of time, and, uh, so we won't be able to get to questions. However, we've taken note of the questions. We will be able to come back to those people um, and potentially answer them through our email as well um, once, we, once we do send it out, reminding everyone that we will be sending out resources and a, a link to this video um, in the coming days via your inbox. Um, but thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, you have great, created such a great um, discussion today, really great insights. Hopefully, we've, uh, a lot of our audience have learned a lot today. Um, but yeah, no, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great, great chat. Thank you.